Today is December 20th, 2022, and my guest is scientist Hannah Ritchie. She is the head of research at Our World in Data, an online web publication focused on research and data to understand and make progress against the world's largest problems. She's also a senior researcher with the Oxford Martin Program in Global Development. Hannah, welcome to EconTalk. It's a pleasure to be here. Our topic for today is the environmental case for eating local food and the concern many people have about what are called food miles. Uh, let's just start with um, the obvious seeming truth that importing food or eating food that comes from far away would seem to be worse for the environment than food that, that is nearby. Uh, and is that true? Not really. I mean, the rationale for it makes sense um, when you think about it. So food is transported across the world. We know that transport tends to emit, uh, emit CO2 because we burn fossil fuels to drive our, our trucks, fly our planes, our ships. So you would think that the further a food has traveled to reach you, the, far, the more the CO2 has been emitted in the process. Um, that is generally true. But I think what people get wrong is that when we look, look overall at the carbon footprint of our food, the transport component for most foods is very, very small. So the, in reality, the, the, the distance your food has traveled to reach you often makes a really, really small part of the carbon footprint of the food that you're eating. Uh, why would that be? Uh, we know that, as you say, travel generally is going to have to burn carbon or unless you're in a sailboat. Uh, but in general, uh, transportation is carbon intensive. Why isn't food, uh, food miles, the distance that food has traveled, an important contributor to the carbon fit footprint of a particular food item? I think there's two key reasons here that people get wrong. I think one is that people massively underestimate the amount of emissions that come from just producing food in the first place. So the, so the emissions from land use change, whether that's deforestation, the emissions from on the farm, so that's cows burping methane, uh, rice emitting methane, putting nitrogen on, on the soil um, and fertilizers, that amounts that emits a massive amount of greenhouse gases. Um, and when we look at the differences in carbon footprint between foods, they're really, really massive. So I think for make, people might have in their head that maybe the differences are maybe 10 or 20 percent. So some foods have 10 to 20 percent higher emissions. When we look at the differences in carbon footprints of foods, we are between the, the highest and the lowest. We're talking about 10 to 50 times as much. So beef, like a kilogram of beef, will emit 10 to 50 times as much emissions as tofu or soybeans. Um, so when you when you then look at the, the 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 emissions from transport, okay, they might go up and down depending on how far it's travelled, but overall that's a really really small share and pales in comparison to like the ten to fifty times difference between different foods. So being in Israel, if I were to eat tofu imported from Australia, just to pick a place that's very far away, yeah, um, that would have a much lower carbon footprint than my neighbor's cow. Yeah, exactly. If I, I was eating beef, but but it's local. I, I, I'm environmentally friendly. Sure. I mean, I think the other core argument there in terms of explaining why the, the carbon footprint of transport is so small is that, I think, especially when we think about international travel, so when people think about food being transported to them from across the world, they imagine that it's coming by plane, right? Um, but that's just not the case. It's very, very rare that foods would be transported by plane because it's expensive and it's energy intensive. Most food internationally is comes by ship. And actually shipping is very carbon efficient. So you're going to emit 10 to 20 times less um, CO2 than trucks per kilometre and 50 times less than flying. So most of your like soy or your avocados are nearly always coming by ship. And shipping actually has like a very, very small carbon footprint. So the reason I love this, of course, well, first of all, I love bringing comfort and solace to my listeners. Those of you who are eating imported food from far away, which uh, you can now maybe, if it, depending on what it is, you can do with a slightly cleaner conscience. Um, but it's a beautiful example of economics in action or, or what is becoming the motto of this program, which is it's complicated. Something that seems obvious that something, things that come from farther away certainly have are bad, much worse for the environment. 
Well, they're a little worse for the environment than eating an avocado from next door, perhaps. So we'll talk about that in a minute. But uh, an avocado from far away might be slightly worse than an avocado from next door, but it's surprisingly small. And of course, the what's often forgotten is that the international component of the transportation is also relatively small, depending on the size of your country and the efficiency of its uh, transportation system. The domestic uh, costs of the uh, of that food item to get to your door or to the grocery nearby are, are quite a bit uh, under often underestimated. Yeah, definitely. I think um, what people underestimate is the emissions from trucking, like domestically within a country. So, like for example, in the UK, we might say like it's British beef. It's British beef, so it's local. But actually, the emissions from trucking beef from a farm. I mean, I live in London. Like I don't have a farm next door. So like getting beef, there is a substantial carbon footprint in trucking that to me. So local doesn't really mean local for everyone. Um, I think the other key point there, I don't want to put across the message that like food miles don't matter at all. I think like for like, obviously it doesn't necessarily make sense to import something from the other side of the world if you can get it next door. What I think people get wrong is that they just get the hierarchy wrong in terms of what matters the most for the carbon footprint of their diet. So people will automatically put eating local at the top when actually in terms of the hierarchy, there are like several things well above that. And okay, maybe if you've like ticked those off and consider those, then you can focus on like the local aspect. But most people put it at the top, which is just incorrect. I think I think that that local point is um is quite subtle and quite beautiful. To walk across to your neighbor's orange tree and pick oranges and take them back to your place is radically different in terms of carbon footprint from buying anything in the store. Because any almost anything in the store has come by a truck and trucks emit a lot of, uh, use a lot of carbon uh, to, to get around. And even in a small country like uh, England, the UK, it's um, not, not insignificant. And for a large country like the United States, to get your avocados from California to um, Florida, I assume that's mostly going to come by truck. There's no boat and, and they're not going to make it by plane, right? Right, exactly. I think, I mean, maybe we'll get onto this paper, but there was one paper that came out which was arguing recently that food miles did matter a lot um, and that eating, eating local was, was, was a really important thing to do. And it was published in Nature Food, so it got, of course, lots of attention. But actually, when you dug into the study, I mean, there was various flaws of the study, but when you dug into it, they ran a scenario where they said, okay, like every country in the world is going to go for this, like this is very hypothetical. Everyone, every country in the world is just going to have a nationalized food system. So there's going to be zero international trade. And they modeled like what would happen to um, food transport emissions. And basically the results they got is that you would reduce food emissions by 1.7%. So less than 2% for the whole world going for a national food system. And one of the key reasons for that is although you were reducing um, emissions from shipping or small amount of flying, you were displacing that by having to truck things around domestically because a local food system is not, is, for most people, it, it's not realistically getting it from your local farmer. It's getting it from 50 miles away or more. Well, actually, it's an underestimate of the effect because food would be so expensive. A bunch of people would die and then there'd be less... Um, food transport probably. So it's probably bigger than 2%, but it's not really a good story um, or 1.7%. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that was a very like hypothetical scenario. And I think the key, the key point there is that the result of like a reduction of less than 2% did not match the title or the subtitle, which was saying that eating local is really important because the result just didn't match the message. Yeah. We, we are going to talk about that. So let's turn to that now. I don't mean to disappoint you, but um, not everybody is excited by nature food. <laughs> Many of us have never heard of the journal, but I assume, I looked it up after I read your article, I, as, I assume it is part of Nature, which is a very prestigious uh, science publication. So they have started a journal called Nature Food to look at these kind of sustainability issues, or maybe other issues related to hunger and poverty. And this splashy article was that food miles are 20% of, of, of emissions, and you had many critiques of the article and we'll post both the original article and and Hannah's piece on it but your 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 point was that first one of your points was that they mismeasured emissions 
And secondly, that they redefine food miles. What did, what did they do to food miles? How should we think of food miles generally? What's the way it's, what's the consensus? How is it generally thought of? And what did they do that you thought was kind of strange? Yeah, so food miles is, is defined as the distance that your food has traveled from production, so from the farm to reach you, the consumer. And that's the transport of food. And the, the transport of food is the key point there. It's not the transport of anything else. It's the transport of food. And that's how it's been defined in the scientific literature. I think that's how the public recognizes and understands that term. And actually the authors of this study like stated that in the opening paragraph, that this is the definition of food miles. What they did in the study was basically redefine that to not only include the transport of food, but also the transport of everything upstream of that. So fertilizers, machinery, livestock, fuel for like cooking the food. So basically the transport of everything that you might consider as inputs into the food system, which is why you just get a much bigger number because we ship fertilizers around, we ship pesticides around. I think what's really important about that redefinition, I mean, I think it's fine to quantify that. It's useful to know what that number is and that might lead to important policy decisions, but it's not good to label that as food miles and reframe that as being important for local food because the transport of fertilizers, pesticides, et cetera, has nothing to do with eating local food. Yeah, that's cool. Um, I want to give my favorite example of these kind of surprising or uh, counterintuitive results uh, on environmental transport and environmentalism generally um, about, I don't know how long ago, maybe 30-ish years ago, there was a big environmental um, attack on what were called on juice boxes. And in particular, a type of juice box, um, which a lot of children, I don't know if they still exist. I think they do. In English, they're called aseptic. Uh, I think is the correct title. They're basically allow the juice to be stored without refrigeration. And it's a very thick plastic paper uh, box uh, that you can jam the straw into. This may be familiar to young children listening, which is a very small number, but maybe to their parents or uh, grandparents, that you would jam the straw into the box and then you'd get the juice out. And environmentalists hated this product because the box is a lot of packaging for the juice. And they, they encourage people to stop buying these and to either squeeze their own juice or, or buy juice in other kind of containers. Uh, what was forgotten in this analysis, and I, I got this from uh, uh, an executive at, at Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola, I think at the time, and maybe still does own Tropicana, which is a big uh, orange juice company. And they were under attack. And uh, this really bothered him because he understood that squeezing your own orange juice, which has zero packaging, zero, because the orange comes in its own package. And then you squeeze it into your own glass, multiple use item. Well, that sounds fantastically better than surrounding the juice with these boxes. Forgetting the fact, and it's very um, analogous to your point, forgetting the fact that transporting oranges is remarkably less efficient than transporting juice. If you transport an orange, an orange is a sphere. Uh, it's going to be transported in boxes, but the number of oranges you can fit in a box and then pile into the truck is going to be radically, uh, the amount of juice that you can transport effectively through a truck, that way it's going to be radically smaller than squeezing the juice at its source, putting it in a box that is rectangular-ish, which you can stack and then use the space on the truck extremely efficiently. So that was the first point. The first point was that the, the air around the spheres of the orange, the roundness of the orange, is a remarkably uh, inefficient uh, aspect. Doesn't mean it's decisive, but you'd want to take that into account. The second thing that people wouldn't normally take into account is that Coca-Cola is really good at squeezing oranges. Uh, they might be better than your home strategy, so they're going to get a lot of juice out of that orange every, every time. And of course, the third thing is the rinds. You might, if you're a good person uh, environmentally, you might compost them or use them for cooking or other or, or beverages, um, a twist. But uh, Coca-Cola has an enormous financial incentive to sell those rinds to, I think it was used for feed and various other uh, things. So actually, 
buying juice box juice is was actually probably been much better for the environment than squeezing your own, which is counterintuitive again. But it, it, it again, the truck is the big problem. Unless you live next to an orange grove, getting the orange to your juicer is remarkably uh, environmentally costly. I mean, there's just so many counterintuitive examples. Like um, one that's like maybe like slightly opposite to what you just said is that um, I think especially when it comes to like fruit and veg, the eat, the eating local message definitely doesn't always stand up. Like I think one of the problems with the eating local message is that it's a generalized message that's supposed to apply to everyone in the world. And obviously that does not make sense. Like someone's local beef may be really sustainable, but for someone, their local beef is cutting down the, the Amazon rainforest because that's what local means for them. Like the, the notion that this could be like a generalized global statement that would apply to everyone is, is just wrong. And I think, uh, especially when it comes to produce like fruit and veg, where is they're very, very location sensitive in terms of like how efficient it is to grow. You often will get the case where a lot of climates are just really poor for producing fruit and veg, and you're way, way, way better to just grow the food where it grows well and grows efficiently, and the climate's correct, and then ship it in. Like the UK is a classic example where it's probably better to buy a lot of our fruit and veg from even mainland Europe, which is relatively close by, but just has the climate to grow stuff. When we don't have the climate to grow, we, we, we try to produce it in greenhouses where we burn a ton of energy to try and mimic the climate that we could just get just across um, the continent. Yeah, it's funny how that works. Now, you also looked at, in a different essay, which we'll link to, uh, you looked at meat substitutes. Um, so when you look, you ranked food, ignoring food miles, I think to start with, you ranked food by its, uh, carbon footprint and beef is crazily, um, carbon intensive. Um, why is that by the way? That's my first question. And then my second question is, uh, if you like something that tastes roughly like meat, why is a meat substitute? better and how much better might it be? And and that was hard to measure, you point out. It was surprisingly hard. Yeah, so the reason, one of the reasons that beef is has such a high carbon footprint, the key one is that it tends to produce a lot of methane. So cows basically produce methane, um, this really powerful greenhouse gas, and that's where a lot of the emissions from beef come from. That's not the only reason. Um, they tend to use a lot of land, which often leads to land use change or deforestation. Even if you're not actively cutting down forests, you're still using land that could be otherwise used for growing forests or using as grasslands. So when we when we think about the carbon footprint of meats in particular, there tends to be a hierarchy where it's just like the bigger the animal, the less efficient it is and the worse it is for the environment. So if you like ranked meats in terms of carbon footprint, it's kind of cow is, is worse, worst then lamb, then pork, then chicken, then fish. So it's basically biggest to smallest. And that's just because um, keeping cows alive, you need to feed a cow a lot more to stay alive than you need to feed a chicken. Um, so that's that's the kind of key reasons why why beef is so bad. And yeah, I wanted to look at, there's tons of studies that have looked at the comparison of, of meats to kind of crop products. So like uh, soybeans or cereals, etc. I think it's, it's just very, very clear that plant-based products have a lower carbon footprint. What was really lacking is um, comparisons to like these actual meat substitute products that we see on the shelves. So the Impossible Burger, the Beyond Burger. Um, and I think to like really kind of grab people's attention, it needs to be tangible and stuff that they're seeing on their shelves. Um, very few academic studies looked at this. So I kind of went on a hunt myself and had to rely on kind of analyses, independent analyses, very much paid for by the meat substitute companies themselves. Now, that's not great. And I think that needs to change. That can't be our own, only analysis of them. But I did de dig quite deep into the data and the methodology and stuff. And I think they are very sound. And even what I know based on my understanding of environmental impacts of food and the ingredients and stuff, I think the results there are very credible. Um, but it's not ideal that you would need to rely on reports basically paid for by the companies themselves. But the results that, that come out is that all of these kind of meat substitute products um, have a lower carbon footprint than meat and especially beef. When we're talking about beef, again, we're talking about 
10 to 20 times less um, per kilogram or per gram of protein. And it's great that you correct for that, of course, because beef is is a vague concept um, that's not a very helpful way to think about in terms of measuring and comparison. You want to measure it in terms of protein. Um, what you're really saying is that meat substitutes, you're, it's a soybean sandwich. You, you might, it's been fancied up a little bit. It might have some mushrooms in it or something else. The more interesting case will be the when we get to more lab-grown meat. And I don't know what, um, have you thought about that at all or looked into it? Yeah, so the, I mean, I, I'm going to like try and defend some of the meat substitutes a bit. I think some are just like soybean sandwich. I think some are actually getting like really pretty close to the experience of eating a beef burger. I mean, I think the Impossible Burger or the Beyond Meat Burger are getting pretty close. Um, I think we can do pretty incredible engineering in, in, uh, in labs now. Um, but to, to get back to the lab grown meat, I think it's a, still a very early stage technology. It's still very expensive, absolutely not scalable at this point. But in terms of the carbon footprint, it has a lower carbon footprint than beef by a, a long shot. Um, but the key problem there is that it's quite energy intensive. Um, the good news on that front is that as we decarbonize our, our energy system, which we will have to do if we're going to tackle climate change, we need to shift from fossil fuels to renewable and nuclear energy. The carbon footprint of that lab-grown meat will fall substantially just because the energy, the, the footprint of the energy that you're consuming should almost drop to zero or close to zero. Um, so currently I'm, I'm slightly optimistic that lab-grown meat makes it in terms of scalability. I'm still slightly skeptical. Um, but I think in terms of environmental footprint, it would it would just have a massive impact if you could mimic the experience directly of beef without the cow. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Petri dishes don't produce that much methane. No. Uh, and test tubes don't either. Uh, I don't know what they grow them in. I just uh, drawing on my extensive high school chemistry background. Um, there's a lot of activity in this area here in Israel. I know there's a lot of creative and smart people working on it. Uh, it'll be interesting to see over the next five to ten years how that world changes and what becomes available. I'm I'm fascinated by it, um, and of course, to the extent I, I'm sympathetic to your claim that the Impossible Burger and Beyond Meat are something they're meat-ish is what I would call them in terms of texture and taste. Uh, they're not quite there. I'm a I love meat, uh, and I eat a decent amount of the, I eat the occasional. I'll say. Beyond uh, beyond meat burger, but I think they're a long way away. And to the extent that lab grown meat will more closely mimic the taste and feel of 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 cow grown beef, which is a really weird thing <laughs> to say, but to the extent can, it, that it's able to do that, uh, I, I think the world will more will much more easily move toward lower carbon footprint diets. So you'll get people who are anxious about the environment, but really love a good hamburger, eating more lab-grown meat to take care of that craving. And of course, if they can bring the cost down significantly, then eventually it could just be a, a financially attractive proposition, which is very, as you suggest, very far away from that right now. Yeah, I think, um, well, one, we can get back to, I'd like to ask you if you had like, just offered you right now, like the lab-grown beef burger or the the cow grown beef burger like what you would choose or whether you would have reservations about the lab grown one i think to look at it in another angle i think the developments in terms of meat substitutes they are nutritious high protein alternatives to meat and i think the reality is that there are billions of people in the world where they do not get enough protein where they are malnourished because they cannot afford a diverse diet and we can't substantially reduce the cost of meat, but we can substantially reduce the cost of meat alternatives by working on these technologies. So I don't just see it as a let's reduce the environmental footprint of um, beef, especially in rich countries, but I see it as a technological pathway to like basically unlocking like affordable protein and nutritious diets across the world. Yeah, no, I think I think it's it'll be a if they can scale it and solve some of these or improve on some of these energy issues, it'll be a game changer for, for lots of 
way beyond just the environment. Why, why would you, why'd you ask me about my choice? You said, if you put them in front of me, which would I prefer? Why do you think, why would you be interested? What would, what would, why would you ask me that? Because lots of people are just, just have like an ick factor to lab grown meat or a common argument I hear is, yeah, it's just not the real stuff. So I'll stick with my cow. Oh, that's interesting. It wouldn't bother me at all. Um, it might bother Nassim Nicholas Talib. I'll have to ask him next time I talk to him. He's he's very worried about um, imprudence in that yeah. kind of area that we don't know exactly what sometimes. I don't know if he feels this way about this issue, but, it, you know, so-called Franken food or, or human designed food and its impact right. on, on the various aspects of the food chain. Those are, I think, good things, very good things to worry about. My impression is I don't think that's an issue here. Um, I would be just... As an aside, I keep kosher. So one of the interesting aspects of lab-grown meat is that uh, Jews cannot mix meat and milk in the same meal. And so a Jew cannot have a real cheeseburger, What who, a Jew who keeps kosher. But a, a kosher-keeping Jew can have real meat with fake cheese, cheese that's non-dairy, and there are such things now, or they can currently have a Beyond Meat burger, which is kosher certified, with real cheese because it's the other one's not meat. If lab-grown meat is considered not meat, which some rabbis will actually have already said that is the case, someone said, yeah, but not all rabbis. Of course not. It'll almost never be the case <laughs> that all rabbis will agree about whether lab-grown meat is, is what is called parv, that is neither meat nor milk. So if lab-grown meat is considered not meat in terms of Jewish law, you could have a cheeseburger with lab-grown meat, a real cheese. But now the final twist is there are people here in Israel I know working on lab-grown cheese that will not be uh, considered dairy. It will have the texture and taste of real cheese. It, the way that lab-grown meat will and it possibly by some rabbis will be considered neither meat nor milk, in which case um, Judaism won't be changed radically because many of the issues of kosher supervision revolve around keeping meat and milk separate and, and, and certain complications that that brings about. So it would be a revolutionary change that many Israeli um, food people are working on, which is sort of an interesting um uh, Perhaps to some people, I don't know. <laughs> no, that's so interesting. I'd never even considered that angle to it. Um, I think it's it sort of overlaps with the question that then I have of for vegans whether they would eat lab grown meat, and it, which comes back to the question: Is a lab grown burger uh, meat? Uh, right, it's exactly right. So psychologically, you could see that some people would say it's quote not the real thing. Uh, and you could also see psychologically people saying, I don't care if it's not the real thing. It feels like the real thing. It looks like the real thing. And therefore, I don't want it. And yes, for vegans and, and Jews who keep kosher, there will be an issue of, um, well, I'll, I'll just quote Stendhal. Stendhal supposedly said on eating ice cream for the first time, what a pity this isn't a sin which is one of the greatest lines of all time, meaning it's so darn good. If it was sinful, it'd be even better. <laughs> and I think, you know, for Jews, eating rabbinically approved meat that is a lot like the real thing chemically or chemically is the real thing might be make them uneasy. Mm. And, and for some, it might make it even tastier. Well, I don't want to judge anybody. Right. I mean, there's so many like kind of thought experiments in this area, like some of them very practical that could actually have like a massive impact. Like the other one is like what I frame as like the hybrid burger, where you could like very quickly massively reduce the amount of meat that we eat globally uh, without changing dietary patterns just by going for a burger, just going half half. So like half of it's beef, half of it is kind of soy or alternatives. Um, and I think when, when, when you do taste tests with people, uh, like blinded taste tests, the, the majority actually prefer the blended burger. I think mm. that effect disappears when you tell them it's a blended burger. So we have the egg factor about it, but actually if, on, a, on a blind taste test, we actually like the taste of it. Mm. Well, I've never been a fan of turkey franks, the, the mm. turkey flavored. <laughs> to me, a hot dog 
it has to be beef. But um, that's a fascinating example of how a very small, apparently small change, but still, it's a beef burger. It just has something else in it. Is uh, would have a radical impact on the contribution of food to to carbon and carbon emissions. Yeah, I think behavior change is, is by far the hardest thing. So anything yeah. that maneuvers around behavior change and requires as little as it's possible, I think, is just really effective. Yeah, they'll, they'll, they'll um, well, a big issue with the with the at least some generation where we are on this now, but you know, meat substitutes was the color and the 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 redness of it, the use of beets and other things to simulate the psychological feeling. Now, there's a weird psychological game you're playing with yourself, obviously, um, somewhere along these lines. But anyway, I, I want to turn to something different. Um, a lot of uh, people are anxious about climate change, and particularly young people have a very, uh, what I would call a doomsday uh, attitude toward it that that the world will end soon, the human component of the world, that that there's no future to the human race, that climate change, this this isn't, for those listening who've never heard this, this is not a fringe uh, idea among a small group of cultists. It's a very mainstream idea among young people in many countries. And I, I want your take on that. And also I want you to talk a little bit, if you could, about, uh, you describe yourself as an environmentalist uh, many people would argue that if you're an environmentalist, you should be sympathetic to this doomsday uh, scenario and concern, and yet you argue that it is not the best uh, approach. So, how, how do you um, tell me? How, tell me your thoughts on that. Yeah, so I think this is actually a really big problem. So, some recent data on it. So, there was a global study that looked basically interviewed 10,000 young people across 10 different countries. And this is ranging from UK and US to Philippines and Nigeria. So really spanning the, the income distribution. Um, and basically asked them about their opinions on climate change and what came out of it. The, the results were very stark. So like more than half of young people said that they thought humanity was doomed due to climate change. Three quarters said that they found the future frightening. A third said that they were hesitant to have children. So I think these feelings are, as you say, they're not fringe. They're very widespread. I think you can question with surveys how much the questions are led and do, 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 what do they really mean by doomed? But I think the overall feeling is that young people are anxious and scared about climate change. And from a personal perspective, I totally get it. Uh, I did really young, long degree programmes in environmental science at university. And when I came out of those, despite being so incredibly passionate about the project, I was like, very close to like turning around and leaving the field because I felt so helpless that I could actually do anything that would make any difference. So I completely sympathize to that. The reason that I am now pushing against it is one, I think a lot of the messaging is just wrong. Like people are just lying when they're telling young young people this. Um, but I think more importantly, I just don't think it's effective in actually driving change. I think it makes people feel paralyzed. I think the um, they feel helpless, so they don't know how to change. Um, I think often if they do feel empowered to change, they will reach for like very extreme solutions. And I think if we're going to make progress on climate change, we need to find solutions that we can all get behind, all kind of build a better future. Um, so I think the divisive solutions don't really work. Um, so yeah, I think it's these messages are so stark and so loud that I think it's just really, really important to push against them. But do you think, I mean, I, I'm, um, I don't think it's particularly productive to try to label where one is on the spectrum of catastrophic change. Generally, um, I, I'm, I, I believe climate change is real. Uh, I, I do think there's some complicated interactions in the climate that are not well modeled in the data that leave some questions very open as to what the most effective uh, ways to fight climate change are. And um, I think there are a lot of natural forces that are going to work in favor of helping us reduce climate change. Um, so in that sense, I'm I'm not a doomsdayer, not even remotely close to a doomsdayer. But I but I, I want to give the argument it's due in that there are serious people who are 
who I think believe this, and they're not saying it for strategic reasons. They're saying it because they think it's true. They think that uh, loss, species loss, habitat loss, uh, ocean ocean uh, rise in ocean levels, uh, um, sea levels around the world. They would the, the the more pessimistic people, and again, I'm not one of those for sure. I'm not at the end at that end. I'm much more uh, likely to believe that adaptation and other behavioral changes will make a big difference. But am I wrong? I mean, you suggest that the data don't support the the catastrophic view, but there are a lot of smart people who are who are not just think of it as a small probability, but think it's quote likely or whatever word you want to put in front of it. What would you point to if you were going to be, you know, push push back on those views? I think, I mean, I, to be very, very clear, I spend I spend my life studying this. I spend my life dry, uh, like pushing for climate action. Um, my point is that climate change is very serious for a lot of people in the world. It will be serious. It will be a serious risk to their livelihoods if we don't take action. Where I push back on the messaging is one that it's an existential risk. It's, the chances of that are very, very slim. Like it's just really, really unlikely that that's the case. Um, for when I say that, I, I mean collectively, globally, especially for people in rich countries. For people in lower income countries, it could be an existential risk, which is why we need to push for action. But the key point of their messaging is often that there's nothing we can do about it. And that's that's completely wrong. That is completely the wrong message. If there's nothing we like, Put, instilling it in people that we're doomed and there's nothing we can do about it is the absolute worst thing that we can do. And none of the climate scientists I respect put that message forward. There's always stuff that we can do. And there's always, if we, if we go past 1.5 degrees, which we will, there's 1.6 to fight for, there's 1.7, there's 1.8. There's always stuff to do. In terms of the data to look at, I think there's, although more broadly things are moving in the wrong direction. There are so many signs of progress that I think are not put across um, effectively. Some of the key ones are that in rich countries especially, emissions are falling and they're falling very, very fast. Um, not on, only are they falling fast, but economies are growing at the same time. In many countries, we have couple, decoupled economic growth from um, CO2 emissions. And this is also true, like the argument that often comes up here is that rich countries have just offshored emissions elsewhere. So that the, the emissions reductions are fake. Um, that's not true. Even when you look at trade adjusted data, which takes that into account, emissions are still falling. Um, what makes me really optimistic is the massive changes in terms of the prices of low carbon technologies. So I think progress on climate change was so slow for a long time because there was basically no affordable alternatives. Fossil fuels were the cheapest. Um, batteries were really expensive. I mean, all of our low carbon technologies, they were just way too expensive to make it into the mainstream. Um, solar prices have absolutely plummeted. Wind prices have plummeted. Battery prices have plummeted. Like My point is that low carbon technology is going to become the, low, the cheapest option as the default. And that just completely transforms where we are in terms of tackling it. So I'm, I'm a little bit skeptical on that. I, you know, I hear a lot of, I don't look at this carefully. It's not a deep concern of mine uh, intellectually. Um, I am worried about the future of the human race, just for the record. I don't think it should be uh, ignored or um, glossed over. But, but people I tend to respect argue that fossil fuels are going to be the dominant financial choice for any level of scale of energy production for a long, long time. Do you think that's not the case? No. I mean, it depends what you mean by a long, long time. We will still be burning fossil fuels for the next few decades, for sure. Um, but much, much fewer than we are today. I think coal will very quickly die out. Um, I think all of the fossil fuels that power electricity predominantly will die out because solar, wind, I hopefully nuclear. Nuclear is a con controversial topic. I'm very in favour of it as part of a, a sustainable energy mix. Um, they will just dominate the electricity mix in the decades to come. Um, where progress will be slower is other industries um, and transport. Some of transport, we will struggle to decarbonize with our current technologies. Um, but road transport, 
uh, especially passenger, we will we will decarbonize um, and we'll just switch to electric um, vehicles. Um, some industries such as cement, etc. There will be some fossil fuels in the energy mix for a significant uh, amount of time, but most of it will go in the next four years. You say four? Forty. No, no, 40. four. Okay, no, few. four. No. Okay, I mean, not few. I mean, just I want to be sure I heard yeah. you correctly. Yeah. Uh, few was like, are you crazy? But okay, <laughs> great. Forty. That means a long time, though, uh, Anna. Just to be to be to be somewhat uh, pessimistic. But uh, let's go back to let's go back to car transport. Um, electric cars, yes, can be uh, cost effective. They're close. Um, perhaps there's an infrastructure issue that's getting solved every day gets better and better i suspect uh as they spread but that electricity has to be generated and that electricity is predominantly generated by by fossil fuels now do you think there's the potential putting nuclear to the side which i'm with you i'm total i'm a huge i would be a huge advocate of nuclear if anybody cared what i thought uh and certainly if, if you ask me I, I think we should be much more um friendly towards nuclear it's I mean, it's just absurd that, that we don't have more nuclear power in the world. But is there really is it really plausible that the solar and wind can generate power at scale for for the grid in any quantity? And, and in particular, do you know what that number is today in a country like the United States? I think it's a tiny portion. And you really think it can grow steadily? Uh, I think here we're falling into the trap of, of looking at like a single or static data point. I think the key the key point about these emerging technologies is that the curve is evolving so quickly. And by so quickly, I'm talking about literally three or four years, especially when you look at the uptake of electric vehicles, where it's basically went from nothing to like globally, it's nearly 10% now, which seems very small, but literally oh, that's, huge. That, that's huge. And that's happened in three years. Um, so it's not about the static data point. It's about, it's about how quickly uh, these trends are shifting. I'm, I'm very optimistic. I think... I used to very much buy into this way of thinking that energy transitions are very, very slow. And historically, when you look, they have been very, very slow. Um, I think that has been completely uh, bucked by renewables. I think we're completely underestimating how quickly they will basically transform the global economy. I'm actually very, very optimistic. So what would be the evidence for that? So you know, the, the level, putting electric cars to the side, I, I, I have to agree with you. I think 10% is an amazing change in a relatively short period of time. And they have many advantages besides environmental issues. Obviously, they're quieter, which has costs, you know, for pedestrian safety. But in general, I like that cars are quieter. Um, they have all kinds of other pluses. Um, what's the evidence that that solar or or wind Again, putting nuclear to the side, that solar wind could could scale. Is is there some sign of that? Are they like ramping up dramatically as a portion of of total energy generated? Yeah, I think the one the cost just factors into it. Where um, they're just going to be the cheapest technology, so it's it's just not going to make economic sense for people for countries to burn coal rather than use solar and wind. Um, there's lots of evidence across a range of different countries, actually across the income distribution, because it's not just rich, like a rich countries are, um, ramping this up, but like across the income distribution, there are a number of countries where it's evolving very quickly. Uh, in the UK, for example, coal has just completely died um, and that's been replaced. It, um, we're not going very hard on nuclear, so it's not nuclear that's replacing it. It's uh, like some of it is gas, but a lot of it's just solar and wind in recent years. Well, the transition to gas is a little bit like the half meat hamburger, right? right? It's it's a it's a more carbon efficient fossil fuel, and I think you know the fracking revolution has had a remarkable impact on that. The first, I assume, I assume an enormous part of the of the transition that you talked about at the beginning of this conversation and this topic is driven by the substitution of natural gas for for coal as a first step. What I'm skeptical about is the transition from natural gas to solar or wind. And I would love to be uh, proven wrong. Uh, recent family debate, I was accused of being pessimistic. And I said, I am, of course, open-minded about this. So, and I'm going to rely on you to add some um, 
reading for for me and my and our listeners uh, that will add to the to the notes on this to get sure. some feel for why you're as optimistic as you are. Sure. Um, deal. Deal. Can I ask why you're so skeptical? Because again, my impression, which again, I'm not, I don't follow closely. My impression is that while there have been improvements in the amount, the total amount of um, solar and wind in in various markets, they have not moved to a significant portion is my impression. So I'd love to be proven wrong about that. Uh, and I worry also that to the extent that they have made a dent, it's due to subsidies. Now, subsidies are not the worst thing in the world. If you think there's an externality from from fossil fuels, maybe they should be subsidized. The question is how much. And and the, the goal of life is not to get to, I don't think, to get to solar or wind as quickly as possible. That would require a massive rearrangement of investment that and, and natural spending that I think would probably be a mistake. So I just, I don't have a feel for that other than that my impression is, is that people are overly enthusiastic about it. So I'd love to be proved wrong or to be educated. So we'll, that, that's your, your project after we, after we finish this conversation. Got it. Okay. Uh, let's turn to your um, project that you're deeply involved in, which is Our World in Data which is a project very close to my heart. I sometimes get accused of, uh, on this program, of being anti-data. I'm not. I'm incredibly pro-data. I think, you know, we should measure what we can measure, measure it well and accurately and compare it over time. And I view your project, uh, Our World in Data, uh, as um, a really important way of helping people figure out what's actually going on in the world. Uh, and to do that, you have to have data. You, you know, m most of my complaints about data are about multivariate attempts to tease out the independent effect of one variable over another, but in actually figuring out what the facts are and where we are in the world and what's happening and what the trends are, I think it's remarkably important. So tell me about that project, why it's important to you, um, and you know, what, how, how, how it got started and um, where you feel it's, it's headed. Yeah, I mean, I think you're right that the only way to like properly understand the world is through data. I think we often rely a lot on anecdotes or news headlines, and that's how we form our worldview. And I think those stories are important, but they don't give us any understanding of how the world is changing overall. So I think a big, a big uh, inspiration for the project overall was Hans Rosling, who really, really brought data to life to show how the world has changed over. 200 years or more in terms of, of human well-being and progress. Um, so the, the project started with Max Roser um, many years ago now. Um, for most of that period, it was him working on his own and then kind of almost posting as a blog on the internet. Yeah. And then he got a little, a few friends around to, to help. So for a long time, we were kind of three or four people. Um, and really, our motivation for the project is that we have this kind of weird position where we're almost like misfits in academia. So I'm based at the University of Oxford, but we don't do original research in, in the normal sense. Where we try to sit is between academia and the public policymakers, journalists. I think what really lies at the heart of it is a lot of the questions that people have on changes they should make, how to make progress, what policymakers should be doing. We already have those answers. These researchers have done the work of figuring this out. The problem is that it's just not communicated properly. So we really see it as a role of how do we take this data and research that we have that people could really be using to put into action and make progress? And how do we tra basically translate it in a way that people can understand and brings out the key points? And we frame it around what we call the world's largest problems. And that's very broad and ranges from global poverty to the stuff I work on in environment, to global war, to inequality and in health. So we did a massive amounts of stuff during the COVID-19 pandemic because we saw that as one of the world's largest problems. So it's very, very broad. And a key point of it, I think, is that most of these topics overlap in some way. So you can't talk about environmental change without considering inequality and global poverty. You can't talk about health without talking about poverty and education. Like all of these topics overlap. And what we want to put forward is providing kind of evidence-based outlook on, on how we understand the world and how it's changing. I'm a big Hans Rosling fan. If you haven't seen his videos, um, 
listeners uh, will we'll link to some of those. They're glorious. And in many ways, uh, you know, he is following on the footsteps of, of Julian Simon, who I would call fundamentally an optimist about the human enterprise, that, that human creativity is the, is the ultimate resource and that we underestimate our ability to respond and to change. And that static picture we often have is, is misleading. And that we go back in time and see how much change has already happened. And we can sometimes look forward to think of what might be possible. Uh, I think of it as, as a fundamentally optimistic uh, perspective on the human experience. And I find that what I find interesting, and I want you to respond to it, is most environmentalists are what I would call pessimists. They're worried and they're anxious uh, and they want to make you nervous and scared. A lot of our world of data is to make you feel better. I know that's not the literal goal. I know the site isn't. It could be called sleep well at night, but it's not. It's called our world of data. I'm interested in more than what can be measured, but what can be measured is not unimportant. And a lot of that is rosier and better than it used to be. And we should be aware of it in how we think about the world and, and whether we sleep well at night. But you... As an environmentalist, do you find that difficult? I mean, a lot of what our world and data publishes, and, and maybe it's only because of what I see because of my biases, but a lot of it is like, yeah, it's not as bad as you thought, is it? And that's generally not the environmentalist um, chair. So what, what are your thoughts on that? I'm going to push back on that a little bit. I, I I don't like that we are framed as like these optimists that like help people sleep well at night. I mean, we... <laughs> try to make people care about global poverty or global health or child mortality. Like it doesn't, I don't sleep well at night knowing that 5 million children will die this year or just under 10% of people live in extreme poverty. Um, what I think is true is acknowledging that we've made a ton of progress and those statements are not opposite to one another and people consider them often opposite to one yeah, another. Well said. Like my, so my colleague, Matt Schozer, um often frames like three statements are true at the same time. The world is terrible. The world is much better. The world could be much better. And like all of those three statements like, can it coexist at the same time and we shouldn't see them as opposites. I think we need to acknowledge the progress we've made and actually study how we did it to make sure that it continues. I think that's the key point we want to get across is that on a lot of human well-being measures, the world is much, much better. We need to, but still not perfect, obviously. And we need to use that information and knowledge to understand how we continue that progress. On the environmental front, it's true that often the cost of human progress has been a degradation of the environment. Um, I think what, why I'm maybe slightly rosier than a lot of environmentalists is one, I think, as we discussed earlier, I've I think the, the recent data on environmental change is very positive and things are eventually moving very quickly when they'd stalled for a long time. Um, but the other dimension to this is that, and I was definitely in a position where I had no understanding of the human progress that we'd made. So I was, I come out of university, all I was faced with was CO2 emissions, deforestation, ocean acidification, all of these ter terrible environmental problems and at the same time I thought more people were hungry than ever global poverty was the highest it's ever been more people were dying from natural disasters than ever before so then just everything seemed hopeless because we were completely ruining the environment and it was a of no um no importance to human progress whatsoever like everything was getting worse at the same time I think mean, for me the changing factor has been I can now see this this historical trade-off where things have massively improved on home and progress and it's came at the expense of the environment. And where I see it now is how do we take those two things that are framed as trade-offs and make them happen together? How do we make progress on both at the same time? And I think we are in a very unique position where we can actually do that. And of course, richer countries tend to be more concerned about the environment because they can be. Uh, or citizens in those countries, not unimportant. And when citizens have a voice, uh, their their material well-being is not unimportant and what they're willing to make sacrifices for. So that alone is important. But, um, you know, I think a lot of, of what you publish, our world and data publishes is, um, yeah, I, I didn't mean to suggest you were just providing a therapeutic role, but but it it is, I think, 
as you said, I think it's really important to understand where we are, where we've been and where we're going. And um, where we are can be, we need to be better. Where we've been is much worse and where we, we go on could be much better still. And I think that's the right way to look at the human experience materially, as long as you take account of what the sources of those changes are. They're not, um, they're not automatic. They depend on certain institutions to, to allow the, just the one I just mentioned, a democratic institutions where people's voice matters, has an impact on climate. Um, and um, that's just one of many. Yeah, I think the, the to come back to Hans Rosling, I think people often framed him as an optimist and he absolutely hated the term because I think people see optimism as this like blind optimism where yeah. if you just leave it, it'll just get better and you can just sit back and do nothing. Yeah. Whereas he framed it as a possibility, possibilitist. So we can make it happen if we want to. Like the decision is ours, basically. We can make it much, much better or we can sit back and do nothing and let things get worse. But the opportunity is there. Yeah. Um, of course, a lot of these things emerge without any one person trying to make them better. But you do need the conditions for that emergence to be in place. The What I consider the the rules of the garden. Most of the, many, many of the best things in life happen without anyone's intention. Uh, but that is worth preserving and needs to be preserved, on, for, unfortunately, and it's not automatic. Uh, certain institutions allow better things to emerge rather than worse things. And we should, why we should think about economics now and then. It's not unimportant. Yeah. Let's, let's close with, um, do you have a favorite chart or, or a diagram from our world of data that you might describe that, and we'll, we'll post it for listeners. I, I, I was just, you know, um, noodling around on on the site earlier today and I stumbled on the proportion of um, free range eggs in the UK and the United States, which I'm very interested in. I've always had a, a strange interest in egg production in chickens, as my readers know, uh, going back to a couple of my books. But, um, you know, they've increased dramatically. Now, I'm not sure they're defined the same in both countries, uh, but it's an interesting example of, of capitalism. People Maybe you, don't, you know people could debate whether enough people are worried about chickens and being free range or not. But whether they're right or not to worry about it, the market has responded. There's a lot more free range eggs available in both places, and I'm sure lots of places around the world. Not all. Um, that's just a fun thing I noticed. You know, it's fun just to play around on the site. But do you have any favorites of things that you that particularly speak to you or spoke to you when you first got started on this? I think I'm going to be cheeky and pick two. So I think the first one is, so Max Schroeser made this chart and it's the world is 100 people over 200 years. And it's basically a facet where it shows poverty, child mortality, vaccination, education, et cetera, and two others. I think literacy and, oh, democracy. Um, and um, basically shows how the world has changed over the last 200 years. And basically you just see these dramatic changes where, the default in the past was extreme poverty and now it's less than 10%. More than half of children died, now it's um, less than 5%. Um, just these really dramatic changes in, in, in the human condition, which um, has been a big inspiration for me and has actually massively shifted my life because I've, I've been able to commit to making a difference because I understand that these changes have happened. Um, so that that's almost been like a counter to like my environmental background where I was just not aware of these changes. But I need to include an environmental one. So probably the environmental one I can uh, include is looking at the mammal kingdom and how it's now distributed. And what we see is that wild mammals are now less than 2% um, of, of the, the world's uh, mammal biomass. So basically... The world's mammals is dominated by humans and our livestock and wild mammals have been shrunk to basically nothing. And I think what that just really, really flags for me is this responsibility that we have to, to build a sustainable future, to look after uh, ourselves and future generations, but also other species. Um, and I like to frame, I, I like to think about this, the Stuart Brand quote, which is, oh, we are as God, so we better get good at it. I think humans we just now we just we just dominate the world and I think we, we need to take that responsibility very seriously. My guest today has been Hannah Ritchie. Hannah, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Thank you very much.
This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.